Here. In accordance with Standing Order 43, the time for member statements has concluded. Questions without notice. The Leader of the Opposition. Thanks, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Communications. Did the Minister think about isolated, vulnerable and older Australians who rely upon postal services to stay in touch with their families and friends before he reduced postal deliveries to those who need them most? The Minister for Communications has the call. Well, I do thank the Leader of the Opposition for his question. You know that there's a by-election on when Labor turns to the old scare campaign, and the scare campaign they're going on this time is about uh, Australia Post and delivery times. The facts are, Mr. Speaker, the, the facts are very clear. The facts are very clear that Australia Post has seen a sharp increase in the percentage of parcels that are being delivered, a sharp increase in the number of parcels that are being delivered, and a sharp increase, a sharp decrease in the number of letters that are being delivered. And that is why we have provided temporary, fixed-term regulatory relief to Australia Post so that it is able to redeploy posties from the area of the business where activity is going down to the area of the business where there is growth so as to secure the employment of uh, posties and to provide Australians with the service that they expect. During the COVID-19 pandemic, what we have seen is a dramatic increase in the number of parcels being delivered because Australians are ordering for more and more uh, over e-commerce. And Australia Post is far and away the market leader in delivering parcels. And to be able to meet the needs of Australians to have parcels delivered, Australia Post has, Australia Post has come to the government and proposed this short-term regulatory relief. And look, that is what we've agreed to. Now, I hear the Leader of the Opposition say they couldn't employ more. Actually, they are employing more—600 more for parcels. 600 more. You know, Mr. Speaker, you know, Mr. Speaker, this is really the case, another case of a typical Labor by-election scare campaign. The facts are not substantiated by their claims. Uh, we've got a Leader of the Opposition who's under pressure. He's under pressure uh, from the member for Rankin. Chalmers plays a long game. Uh, you know, I, just when, say, uh, I just say to the minister, he's, he's now straying from the question. <laughs> Those, these are highly relevant considerations. <laughs> the minister will resume his seat. The leader of the opposition on a point of order. Yes, Mr. Speaker. This question was about isolated, vulnerable, and older Australians who rely upon their posty to deliver letters to them. He hasn't mentioned any of them. The He's just Leader of the politics. Opposition will, hasn't mentioned resume any his, will resume his seat. And I just say to the Leader of the Opposition, as he, as he well knows, it's uh, not incumbent on those answering the question to mention uh, particular words in the question. The Minister is in order. I call the Minister for Communications. Well, Mr Speaker, we're all concerned about isolated and vulnerable Australians, such as the isolated and vulnerable Leader of the Opposition. <laughs> because. You know, we've got the member for Rankin. Uh, he's in his safe place, running in the Brisbane Co Daisy Hill Conservation just, Park. Just so and of course, the, 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 the member for, for Maribyrnong, also a keen no, runner. The min he should the, be very worried when the they minister all start running. Will resume his seat. <laughs> he, he is finished. Too right. <laughs> we'll just go to the next question. <laughs> the member for Sturt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Will the Prime Minister outline to the House key outcomes from today's National Cabinet meeting? aimed at driving Australia's economic recovery from the coronavirus pandemic. The Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for Sturt. And I also thank the Premier of South Australia, from which the member Sturt hails from, and thank all the Premiers for, for the great work they've done as, and Chief Ministers in participating in the National Cabinet. The National Cabinet, Mr Speaker, has been one of the most important mechanisms through which Australia has sought to manage the very complex issues that have been before us during this COVID-19 crisis. One of the things that has stood Australia out from so many other countries, particularly those with federal systems, has been the way that Australia's federation 
uh, has been working together with all the premiers and chief ministers. That's not to say there aren't disagreements. It doesn't to say there's always complete uniformity. Of course there's not. Uh, we wouldn't expect that to be the case, but the commitment shown by all those premiers and chief ministers I want to thank very much. Not all agreed, not all supported, uh, not all were as kind to the formation of this national cabinet as the government has been, Mr Speaker, but we will remain committed to that and have enshrined the national cabinet together with the National Federation Reform Council as the new way forward of managing federal affairs uh, for this country. Now, today uh, we focused on the usual agenda and that is on the economic crisis that Australia faces and continuing to manage the health crisis that Australia faces. And now we're in the phase of reopening our economy under the three-step plan uh, that was committed to by National Cabinet some weeks ago. And we are on track, we are on target uh, to reach that third step of that plan. States like Western Australia and the Northern Territory uh, are already there in step three. Uh, South Australia equally moving into that territory, uh, New South Wales, even Victoria, uh, Queensland. I welcome, I, we, I welcome the opening of the borders in next month, Mr. Speaker. Uh, in Queensland, they've torn down that wall there, Mr. Speaker. I'm very pleased that they have. Very pleased that they have, and I'm very pleased that South Australia is also responding and uh, nominating the date by which those borders come will come down. And we, we look forward to other states following suit, and I thank them for the good faith way they engaged on these issues today. But importantly, opening up and removing more restrictions, particularly in July when it comes to indoor venues, one of the most difficult Mr. Speaker, issues that we have dealt with has been uh, funerals and attendance at funerals. And step three, previously, put a 100 limit on the attendance at funerals in most parts of the country today. It's only as much as 50. But in step three, that limit will go, and the number of people who can attend a funeral indoors will only be limited by the four square metre rule, and outdoor they'll be able to have many more, provided there is appropriate seating. And I know that will be welcomed by so many Australians, Mr Speaker. This has been the biggest of so many hardships that Australians have had to confront in not being able to say goodbye to their loved ones. There have been the many others. Prime Minister's many son others, but that one is an important challenge. Concluded. The member for Macquarie. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. 41 homes were lost in my electorate during last summer's bushfires. People have told me they want to rebuild, but it's unlikely they'll be able to sign a contract by the end of the year. How will the Prime Minister ensure that bushfire victims like these ones can access the Home Builder Scheme? The Prime Minister. Well, thank you, uh, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for her question, and I commend her for the work that she's done within her community, as I do all those members who have been in bushfire-affected areas, uh, for the work they've done in engaging communities and raising issues that, that need to be addressed. Um, the commitment that we made to the states and territories was to um, joint fund the demolition work that was being done across all of those buildings uh, that were, uh, were damaged and, and destroyed during the course of the bushfires. The advice I have from uh, the state government in New South Wales is that demolition work will be completed next month but is already uh, progressing through so many parts of the state. That is the project which is managed, as you know, by the state government. They're running the contractors and they're doing it at a cracking pace. And I'd commend them for doing that and to keep pushing forward. Uh, the Home Builder Program, um, as introduced by the Minister for Housing and, and by the Treasurer, enables uh, grants of 25,000 for those who are eligible under the income test rules uh, to be able to uh, support the construction of new homes. And one of the key issues I've been discussing with the state and territory premiers uh, has been how we can escalate how we can more rapidly ensure that approvals are given, not just for these types of cases, but more generally. Um, the purpose of the 25,000 principally was to bring forward projects that are already approved but people weren't going to proceed with. And so we get those projects happening again. But uh, people in affected areas are eligible for these grants, sub uh, subject to, of course, the income restrictions that are placed on those. And I'll be working closely with the states and territories exactly. to ensure that they can accelerate the rate of home approvals, uh, not just in these areas but everywhere, because it, it, this is critical to job creation. It's absolutely urgent for those who are impacted by the bushfires, certainly, definitely, uh, but it is also critically important for those whom their jobs depend on getting these projects started. There is no greater focus this government has ever had than on job creation 
in the wake of the COVID crisis and indeed in, 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 in the wake of the bushfire crisis. Rebuilding communities, rebuilding homes, rebuilding jobs and rebuilding our economy. The member for Leichhardt. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr Speaker. And my question is to the Minister for Health. Will the minister please update the House on the value and importance of medical advice in supporting and informing the decisions of the National Cabinet? The Minister for Health. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. And I want to uh, thank the member for Leichhardt for his work in standing up for the health of Australians in far north Queensland and, in particular, in advocating for the health of Indigenous Australians. On the basis of medical advice, which has been so fundamental to Australia's response, today we have lifted the restrictions with regards to the rings of containment or biosecurity zones for remote Indigenous communities in Queensland, in his own area. This follows the same decisions on the basis of medical advice in the Northern Territory and Western Australia. These zones were put in place in order to save and protect some of our most vulnerable Australians. The extraordinary thing which has occurred is that at the outset of the arc of the virus, our fear was that we would see widespread disease and loss of life in First Nations communities, in Indigenous Australians, as sadly we have seen in many other jurisdictions overseas. The best advice that I have as of today is that right across Australia's remote Indigenous communities there has not been a single confirmed coronavirus case. That has meant that lives have been saved, livelihoods protected, futures, cultures put in place and given primacy off the back of that medical advice. That is one of our great national achievements, and people on all sides have contributed to that. But the chief medical officer, the deputy chief medical officers, the state and territory chief health officers helped build this policy of protection. They helped provide the advice to the national cabinet, and we put it in place under the biosecurity emergency powers. And now, as it's deemed safe, we've had the privilege of removing those restrictions and allowing these communities to return to, to normality. And as we've gone through this process, whether it's been the listing uh, of coronavirus as a disease of human pandemic potential, the difficult decision to close the borders with China on 1 February, which was so opposed by the WHO and by China itself, but a decision which saved lives, all of these things have mattered. Right now, the medical advice, though, is absolutely clear. The single biggest risk we face is of uncontrolled mass gatherings. No matter what the nobility of the cause, no matter what the purpose, there is no immunity for Australians who are in close proximity in an uncontrolled situation. That advice was set out by the medical expert panel yesterday, repeated by the chief medical officer today. These gatherings could risk life and I urge all Australians to help protect lives and to keep their distance the and to make their voices known in concluded. other safe And I call the member for Jagger Jagger. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. I refer to the Prime Minister's comments about his home builder scheme. If you've been putting off that renovation or new build, the extra $25,000 we're putting on the table means now's the time to get started. How many Australians who have been putting off renovating their kitchens or bathrooms will get a cent from this scheme? The Prime Minister. Well, thank you, Mr Speaker. The scheme provides for 27,000 new projects, which is 7,000 um, renovation slash new builds, it's substantial renovations, which are new builds, Mr new Speaker, and 20,000 new home constructions. It was never the intention of this program to provide subsidy support for small-scale renovations. That was not the purpose. And I'll tell you why we weren't going to do that. We weren't going to do that, Mr Speaker, because the risk of integrity to the program and a repeat of the insulation bats farce that occurred under the Labor Party, where people were going around knocking on doors, basically pulling in pink bats and saying they're going to put them in your roof and pocketing the difference, it was a joke. 
It was a complete failure, Mr. Speaker. Member for Isaacs, and four the member for people died, Mr. Speaker, in relation to that program, Mr. Speaker. They died as a result of that program, as established, Mr. Speaker, in a royal commission. I note, Mr. Speaker, I note in a royal commission. The Prime Minister through those will pause for a second. Prime Minister will pause for a second. The member. Okay. Now that the member for Isaacs has finished, he can leave the chamber under 94A. The member for Mitchell is warned. The member for Deakin will cease interjecting. The Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So on this program, we were not going to give rise to a situation where people passing themselves off as kitchen renovators were going to go and knock on the doors of pensioners, rip out their sinks and their dishwashers, and then seek to try and claim some government subsidy. That's not the nature of this program. This isn't about for do-it-yourself home renovations. This is about approved work by certified builders of significant scale. Mr. Speaker, to enable people to bring forward projects that they have put off and now can proceed with. Now, I note the derision that is applied by those opposite to someone who might be proceeding with a substantial renovation, a new build of their home of some 150,000. Mr. Speaker, the average loan taken out for a renovation is $164,000, Mr. Speaker. And I can tell you that's the case because there are families around this country who cannot afford to go and build a new home. Their, their families are expanding, their children are going up, they can't afford to sell their house and go and buy a new piece of land and engage in a new construction. So what do they do? They borrow money to expand their existing home and renovate substantially their existing home because they can't afford to build a 300,000 or 350,000 new home. Mr Speaker, the opposition's derision of this initiative smacks of two things. One, they never learnt the mistakes of their failed schemes when they were in government. Member and, Mr Lawler. Speaker, they don't know what's going on in the suburban families of this country. The member for Clark. Speaker, my question is to the Prime Minister. Prime Minister, there are 140,000 fewer apprentices than there were in 2013, and no wonder when $3 billion has been cut from VET funding in that period. This puts standards and safety at risk, reduces job opportunities and increases labour shortages. TAFEs in particular are in dire straits. For example, a second-year trade apprentice at TAS TAFE has not been offered any online learning for a core subject during the pandemic and has had to make do with a single 30-minute phone call with his teacher. Prime Minister, what are you going to do about this? When will the government give vocational training the priority this country needs now more than ever? The Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I thank uh, the member for his question. And I, I agree with his uh, suggestion of the need to ensure this is a national priority, and that's why I have done exactly that. Mr Speaker, several weeks ago when I stood up the National Press Club and when we established the National Federation Reform Council, and today, in fact, at the meeting of National Cabinet, we established skills as one of six key areas that needed to have greater cooperation and support from states, territories and the Commonwealth Government to ensure that we're getting people rightly trained, rightly skilled to get into the jobs that are going to build businesses into the future. Now, this is an area that has had a very vexed history. The Commonwealth, by law, is required each year to sign out a cheque to the state and territories, each to the value of some $1.5 billion. It's guaranteed and it's indexed, so we are required by law to continue to provide that funding. There is nothing in that arrangement, which was set in place by the previous government, that enables any of that funding to be directed towards TAFE or private training or tagged to any particular outcome or training any particular group of people or matching it against any identified skills need. And as a result, these are matters, TAFEs in particular, their funding source, their level of funding is totally determined by state governments. That's how the system works. Now, there are varying results. I learned today from the New South Wales Premier that during the COVID crisis, some 100,000 people, through the initiative the New South Wales government has put through their TAFE to get people training during the COVID crisis, they've got 100,000 who've completed those courses. That's fantastic. That's a state government that's getting on with that job, and I would commend those sorts of initiatives and all premiers uh, listen to what the premier in New South Wales said today. The partnership we have on skills has got to be better. That's what I'm saying. 
What we're doing at the moment is putting over one and a half billion dollars every year with no accountability for outcomes. And that's not good enough. And that agreement needs to change. It has to respond to identified skills needs and changes that need to be made in the skills and training system. And that is exactly the type of reforms that my government is seeking to pursue even as we speak. The member for Ford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Indigenous Australians. Will the minister outline how the Morrison government has been supporting Indigenous Australians through the COVID-19 pandemic and how the new national agreement on closing the gap will change the way we work with Indigenous Australians? The Minister for Indigenous Australians. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank the member for Ford for his ongoing interest in matters to do with our people. Indigenous Australians. What COVID has shown very successfully and the work around the partnership is that by working in joint arrangements we've achieved the outcomes that we were seeking in COVID whilst we had the bureaucracy in place to protect people. At the community level, by engaging leaders and engaging the communities in those discussions, we achieved incredible outcomes. The Closing the Gap partnership has meant that leaders in that process have sat at the Cabinet table with the Prime Minister, unheard of. They have also sat with our agencies and with state and territory governments and have negotiated every page of the partnership plan, looking at solutions and the way in which we will collectively close the gap in all of those critical areas that will impact on the quality of life. The Voice is another where we are allowing Indigenous Australians to shape that, not governments, not bureaucracies. And so what we're doing as a government, we are working with Indigenous Australians to find the solutions that will improve the quality of their life across so many facets of what's occurring. And more importantly, around a cabinet table when we were discussing some matters, the Prime Minister made it very clear that the Minister for Indigenous Australians wasn't the only minister responsible, that all of us <clears throat> around that cabinet table had to engage with Indigenous Australians in a very different way. A member for Solomon, the partnerships that we've got with Indigenous Australians means that they own both the solutions and the way in which we will implement, because for too long we have done things to Indigenous Australians. It doesn't matter what the program is, we've defined it and said you will operate within this parameter. On cultural matters, negotiations have occurred with the um, Minister for the Environment on some of the key directions we're thinking about and the way in which we can protect our cultural heritage. And that work is continuing with a genuine desire to have the Indigenous leadership involved in telling us what it is that is needed. That will change the way in which we will achieve outcomes in this nation that we've not achieved thus far. Because any of us, when we negotiate with local governments or state governments, we negotiate every point thoroughly. We're now doing that with Indigenous Australians. And both the partnership agreement and the COVID experience has showed us that when you give people the opportunity to determine their own direction, they will take that responsibility, stand up and meet the challenge. Thank you. The member for Blacksland. Thanks, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Housing. In question time on Tuesday, when the minister quoted the publication Domain, had he also read these domain stories? Home builder might be the most complex, least equitable construction jobs program ever devised. And home builder, eight ways that $688 million could be better spent on housing to stimulate the economy. If this is what a real estate publication thinks of this scheme, isn't it time to rename it Home Blunder? The Minister for Housing and Assistant Treasurer has the call. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. The Shadow Minister. Uh, wants to bring out quotes. Well, I've got a lot of quotes for the Shadow Minister. The Shadow Minister and, indeed, the Shadow Treasurer on the day that they came out to criticise this policy said the Master Builders Association have criticised this policy. So relying on the Master Builders Association, which was a surprise to the Treasurer and the Prime Minister and I, 
because the head of the Master Builders Association was with us when we announced this policy. And indeed, I quote, said the following. Master Builders Australia believes that the federal government's announcement of the Home Builders Scheme today will be a massive relief to the thousands of home builders and tradies around the country. Are you listening, Shadow Minister? Again, Home Builder will be a lifeline for an industry facing a valley of death in the coming months. It will mean more new homes, more small businesses and jobs are protected, and provide a stronger bridge to the economic recovery of our country. And it goes on and on and on. In fact, I'll continue. I'll continue if we've got, got quotes. We've got a home builder, Jesse Zilke uh, from uh, Bundaberg, who said the following in response. On the first Saturday after the home builder was announced, on the first Saturday, the response that they had for their house and land packages meant she said the following. We're gearing up. I've employed three people this week in various roles. I've been in contact with some subcontractors, suppliers, to make sure we can handle them. It's certainly going to be a boost locally to jobs uh, and the industry. It goes on and on. In the domain article that the minister, shadow minister referred to, in that domain article it referred to the fact that house and land packages throughout this country increased last Saturday by up to 70 per cent. Now, what do new home sales? What do new home sales mean? It means what I said earlier this week. The hundreds of thousands of jobs in the residential construction industry are protected. Yeah, yeah. Now I know the shadow minister probably hasn't come across a tradie. He's been here a bit too long uh, in the halls of Canberra. But hundreds of thousands of tradies, carpenters on building sites, bricklayers, electricians, plumbers, and in regional Australia, the timber mill workers who make the frames and trusses, the manufacturers who make the bricks and the glass and the tiles. Those hundreds of thousands of jobs will be protected. We estimate 20,000 new homes, 7,000 substantial rebuilds. And those 20,000 new homes, we've also seen evidence, is overwhelmingly supporting new home buyers. So the Labor Party have opposed the first home super saver scheme. They've opposed the first home loan deposit scheme. Now they oppose home builder. The coalition is the party of home ownership in this country and residential construction jobs. The member for Lawler is now warned. I've asked her to stop interjecting on numbers of occasions this week. The member for New England. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Prime Minister of the Commonwealth of Australia and Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development. Mm. Will the Deputy Prime Minister inform the House how the McCormick Morrison Government Jobmaker Plan is supporting and creating jobs in the construction industry as part of the recovery from COVID-19? Uh, call the Deputy Prime Minister and point out that's the only Deputy Prime Minister we can ask a question of in this place. But, uh, <laughs> Deputy Prime Thank you for pointing that out, Mr Speaker. And, uh, <laughs> good question, good member. Yeah, yeah. He knows all about jobs, jobs, jobs. We all on this side know about jobs, jobs, jobs. And I'm going to outline three projects in the member for New England's electorate which are all about job maker, all about job creation all about the $100 billion, 10-year pipeline of investment that we are doing in New England, we are doing right across this wide brown land. Mr Speaker, 85,000 jobs are being created by our vision, our plan, our blueprint for infrastructure for the rollout of jobs, jobs, jobs. And, uh, and I know the Bolivia Hill realignment on the New England Highway, 38 kilometres south of Tenerfield. There he was the other day, the member for New England, looking at this, what is, could only be described as a breathtaking piece of infrastructure. It's a prime example of government investment directly creating jobs. This project includes 2.1 kilometres of new road and a 320 metre long cantilever bridge. So far, piers one and two, as well as eight of the 60 segments, are completed. We have partnered with the New South Wales government to get this job done, an $80 million project. And Tenderfield Mayor Peter Petty he said, quote, the families who have lost loved ones on this stretch of road had been fighting hard for this and it was well known as a black spot. Member for New England, he's been fighting hard for this too. And we're delivering. We're delivering. We are delivering. This project alone is supporting more than 750 direct and indirect jobs through the construction phase. And the flow on benefits are just enormous. And then, of course, we've got Dungown. And uh, the member for New England and I know how important this was. 
uh, is there. We were on October 13 last year. Prime Minister was there. Deputy Premier was there. Friends all. And we are, we are getting on. We are getting on with this project, Mr. Speaker. This is going to provide water security for those on the Peel River. That's going to provide water security to enable to enable agriculture, livestock, fodder, dairy, horticulture, all those sorts of things. And I know how important that is for the, for the people in the member for New England's electorate. Uh, first built in 1958, the, dam, the Dungown Dam that's there at the moment has been supporting farmers along the Peel. But this new structure, three times the size, is going to create so much jobs, so many jobs and so much investment, so many opportunities. And of course, uh, we're also we're also getting an upgrade for the Pioneer Kalala Cottage Hut. Now, not, not, not a big project in the scheme of things, but so important, so important for our nation's heritage, so important to remember the pioneers of New England, those hard workers who built the New England on the sweat of their own brow, Mr Speaker. These are good investments. These are creating jobs. This is the sort of vision that we on this side of the House are producing, are investing in and are making sure that we deliver. The member for Blacksland again. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Yesterday, the Treasurer used the $1 billion National Housing Infrastructure Facility as evidence that this government was supporting the community housing sector. Given Treasury has revealed a short time ago that $999,800,000 of this still has not been spent, isn't this just another example that the government is leaving Australians behind? It's available now. The Treasurer has the call. The member for Deakin, the Assistant Minister for Housing, cease interjecting. The Treasurer has the call. Mr Speaker, NIFIC, as I said to the House yesterday, is a billion dollar uh, program that was established by the former, pri uh, former Treasurer and now Prime Minister, which is out there providing support on top of our other social housing initiatives, which I announced yesterday, including in the uh, Hobart City deal, Mr. Speaker, providing support for those in the community who need that community housing. <laughs> Members on my left. The member for Bass. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Will the Treasurer outline to the House how the Morrison government's responsible economic management and recovery plan will strengthen Australia's economy and get Australians back into work in the wake of the coronavirus? The Treasurer. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I thank the member for Bass for a question acknowledged before coming to this place. She was a farmer and a mayor of Georgetown, Mr. Speaker, and is making a great contribution on behalf of her constituents in this place. And the member for Bass, like members on this side of the House, know that we have a, entered into this economic crisis from a position of economic strength, Mr. Speaker. We delivered the first current account surplus in 40 years. We saw welfare dependency at its lowest level in 30 years. We delivered the biggest tax cuts this country has seen in more than 20 years, and the budget was in balance for the first time in 11 years, Mr. Speaker. And that economic strength allowed us, in the words of the OECD just earlier this week, to provide massive macroeconomic support to the Australian people through the COVID crisis, Mr. Speaker. Support through the cash flow boost the extension and the expansion of the instant asset write-off, the effective doubling of the safety net, net with the Job Seeker Coronavirus Supplement and, of course, the Job Keeper Program. The Job Keeper Program providing employers around the country and employees with the support through this crisis, like Flinders Island Aviation, Mr. Speaker, where Peter has been able to keep his four staff on the Job Keeper Program and when he's been able to continue to provide essential passenger and also the freight logistics support to those isolated communities. And in the words of Peter, uh, at, the, at this particular business, uh, he said that JobKeeper has not only enabled him to keep his staff on, but will enable his business to bounce back after the restrictions are lifted. Now, Mr Speaker, the strength of our support through this crisis has seen Australia perform very well, not just on the health front but also on the economic front compared to many other nations. And as the OECD yesterday said, the Australian economy is expected to contract by 5% this calendar year and to strengthen by 4% in 
next calendar year. That compares to the United States, which is expected to contract Mr. Speaker, by 7.3 per cent this year, or New Zealand at 8.9 per cent, or indeed the United Kingdom at 11.5 per cent. Now, Mr. Speaker, the OECD also pointed out the risk of a second wave of cases. And on their numbers, this could hurt the Australian economy and cost the Australian economy $80 billion this year and next. $80 billion this year and next if we have a second wave of cases. That's why the Australian people have to follow the health advice. That's why we have to be vigilant. That's why we have to be patient and considerate of our fellow Australians to ensure that we don't throw away the gains that, we've, that have been hard fought and that Australians have made great sacrifices for to ensure that we've flattened the curve. The member for Hindmarsh. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Does the Prime Minister agree with the Australian's economics editor, Adam Crichton, who says that the government's response to COVID-19 was an act of hysteria because the virus has only led to the deaths of, and I quote, quite unwell elderly people? If not, why is the Minister for Energy co-hosting a boardroom dinner with Mr Crichton to raise money for the Liberal Party's Ed Monero campaign? The The Leader of the House, <laughs> members on my left. Mr Speaker, that's a question about fundraising, which is clearly a political party matter. Um, yeah, there's, there were two questions. Uh, so um, we're not going to have a ballot on the ruling. I'm just going to make the ruling, OK? <laughs> um, there are certainly two questions. Um, the second one. I think struggles to be in order, but certainly I'm happy to hear from the manager of opposition business. Anything Angus touches? The, the purpose of the question is to ask whether or not the Prime Minister agrees with the comments that were quoted in the question. Yep. Uh, and the second part of the question is clearly framed at the beginning of it, if not. So if the Prime Minister does disagree, why are these sorts of things happening from one of his own ministers? The Minister for Government Services will cease interjecting. But I can understand both parts of it go to the same issue yes, as to the, the extent Prime to Minister, which the government disagrees. The Prime Minister isn't responsible for uh, actions ministers take on party activities. So it's really irrelevant whether he agrees or disagrees. But the first part of the question is in order. Speaker, I don't agree with those comments. Because, Mr Speaker, what Australia has done over these many months in which we have been combating the COVID-19 global pandemic is we have been conscious right from the start of the need to address both the health challenge and the economic challenge. Now, there are extreme views on, 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 in, this, in this debate. There are, there are more extreme views which said it was, there, was, there was nothing going on here, Mr Speaker, and there are others who said that um, you know, more extreme action should be taken in terms of measures. Now, it's a free country, Mr. Speaker, and, and we support people um, what you know can can express whatever views they wish on these matters. This is is not something that I am seeking to uh, express any judgment against the individual uh, that has been referred to in the question in any way, shape, or form. I just happen Member to have a different point of view and a point of view that has been informed by the government's actions, Member for which shows that we took early and strong and important actions that has both protected lives and protected livelihoods. Right. And Australia stands out around the world Correct. as being the leader both on the economic response, as is demonstrated by the OECD figures, and on the health response, which has, uh, has been demonstrated by uh, the much lower death rate in Australia, when it's 100 times more in countries that are overseas. Had we not taken the decision Mr. Speaker, to take action on health, then we would not be in the position today to address the economic opportunities as we come out of this crisis. We are well ahead of where we'd hoped to be, and there are different experiences in different countries. The Treasurer just made mention. In New Zealand, they went to a full lockdown, Mr. Speaker, a full lockdown, and their expected uh, position this year on their economy is down 8.9 per cent. Now, we didn't go to that extreme, and we're looking at a 5 per cent reduction. Every country will make its choices. We've made the right choices, Mr Speaker. The member for Mallee. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction. Will the Minister update the House on how the Morrison McCormack government is supporting job creation infrastructure that will secure the affordable and reliable energy that Australians rely on while at the same time lowering reductions? Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for her question. As, as a former social worker, she knows how important affordable energy is for the most vulnerable in our community, Mr. Speaker. Now, she also knows we're investing in the uh, technology and the energy infrastructure, which will bring down electricity prices, ensure we keep the lights on while we're reducing our emissions. And, Mr. Speaker, just recently we launched our technology investment roadmap consultation paper. Uh, and that focuses, Mr. Speaker, on technology, not taxes. Technology, not taxes, reducing the cost of energy, not raising it. Uh, it's all about making sure, Mr. Speaker, that we have more jobs and more investment as we come out of the COVID crisis. Now, we've also recently uh, announced the first round of the microgrid program, and there was a program in the members' electorate, $1.4 million for Tana Gala uh, in, her, in her electorate, Donald as well for a microgrid which will reduce the cost of energy in remote communities like in the Mallee, Mr. Speaker, like in the Mallee, using the very best technology available. Now, Mr. Speaker, uh, this focus on investment in critical infrastructure using the best uh, technology available applies also to our Snowy 2.0 project, $1.38 billion invested by the federal government, and the people of the Snowy Mountains know what benefits this will bring. And those benefits aren't just about bringing down electricity prices and keeping the lights on. They're also about creating jobs in the Snowy Mountains region. Mr. Speaker, we've already seen $35 million of direct expenditure in the Snowy Mountains region as a result of Snowy 2.0. Uh, and Mr. Speaker, we know there's already 500 people involved in the construction project. By the end of this year, it will be 850 and, at peak, 2,000 jobs created from Snowy 2.0 in the Snowy region, Mr Speaker, this will be a jobs boom for the Snowy region. Now, local businesses are also involved, 100 businesses, Mr Speaker, and we know James from Allspec Partners uh, in Tumut uh, is providing surveying services and machinery hire uh, for Snowy 2.0. Uh, we know that Monero Milk uh, and, uh, and Juice is growing their business on the back of providing food and drinks up to the Snowy work sites. And of course, Matt at Coffee Peddler on the beautiful Winyer Street in Tumut is providing coffee, snacks and lunch up at Lobs Hole, one of the main work sites at Snowy 2.0. Mr Speaker, our focus is on technology, not taxes, jobs and investment, a stronger economy as we come out of the COVID crisis. The Leader of the Opposition. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister has received a recommendation from the Defence Honours and Awards Appeals Tribunal that Tasmania's Teddy Sheehan be awarded a Victoria Cross for, and I quote, the most conspicuous gallantry and a preeminent act of valour in the presence of the enemy. Why does the Prime Minister need another review to tell him that Teddy's sacrifice should be honoured with the Victoria Cross? The Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for his question. There is absolutely no doubt that Teddy Sheedon was an extraordinary Australian who did extraordinary things at a time that none of us in this place can possibly imagine. And the issues that were confronted by service men and women at that time is nothing we can imagine their commanders and those who were there at that time and made judgments on these issues. So when one goes back and looks at these matters again, one must be very careful when they're putting themselves in the place of others who were there at the time. Now, Mr Speaker, the tribunal, the four members of the tribunal, not all 11, but the four members of the tribunal, it was a unanimous decision, not 11, unanimous. just four. Unanimous. It was just four. I just point that out to the, to the, to the Leader of the Opposition, as he, as he represented that all 11 <laughs> members of the tribunal made that decision. That is, that, in fact, not the case. There was four, Mr Speaker. But, Mr Speaker, equally, when the government receives the recommendation from the tribunal, 
the government then needs to consider that recommendation in forming a view, and indeed the, the minister and then the prime minister needs to form a view. And so you take advice, no. Mr. Speaker, from all of the agencies uh, that would have a relevant view on this, as I have done. And I table, Mr. Speaker, the letter from the chief of the defence force, General Campbell, for the purposes of this uh, uh, question and for the information of the House. I can assure you, Mr. Speaker, as a Prime Minister and Chair of the National Security Committee of Cabinet, that I do not consider the advice of the Chief of the Defence Force likely. I consider it very carefully. And it wasn't just the current Chief of Defence Force, Mr. Speaker, not just the current Chief of the Defence Force that I have consulted on this matter, but many others. Many others, Mr. Speaker, who have served in that capacity in recent times. So I'm not going to consider the advice that comes from the single person who commands every single man and woman who serves in our defence forces lightly. So the issue that is raised in relation to this matter, Mr. Speaker, is whether compelling new evidence has been presented and is available for me to take a decision that would enable me to make a recommendation to Her Majesty. Now, Mr Speaker, that matter, on my advice, is in dispute. And so I have sought advice from the former Defence Minister, the former Solicitor General, the former Secretary of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, and one of the most renowned military historians in this country to consider that very precise question. And, Mr Speaker, if that advice comes back and says that that very high bar has been, uh, then, Deputy Mr. Speaker, the if that has been passed, then that is helpful advice. And I can assure you, because I consulted the Chief of the Defence Force on this the matter, Prime Mr. Minister's Speaker. The time has concluded. The Leader of the Opposition is seeking to table a document or documents. Yes, Mr. Speaker. I seek leave to table the unanimous report of the Defence Honours and Awards Appeals Tribunal, Barnett, and the Department of Defence, Ree Sheehan. Of 23rd July 2019. Is leave granted? The Leader of the House. It is not granted, it's a public document. The member for Herbert. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Defence Industry. Will the Minister outline to the House how the Morrison government is keeping the wheels of our defence? Member, yeah, Fisher, sorry, member for Herbert, if you could just pause for a second, just let broadcasting get the microphone on, and perhaps if you stand a little closer. To it. Thank you. We'll try again. The member for Herbert. Sure. <laughs> Thanks, Speaker. <laughs> My question is to the let, Minister let me know for if Defence I can help Industry. Anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Will the Minister outline to the House how the Morrison government is keeping the wheels of our defence industry turning to support our economic recovery as we come out the other side of the COVID-19 pandemic? The Minister for Defence Industry has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I, I want to thank the member for Herbert for his question and thank him for his service to the nation, but also acknowledge his passion for Australian defence industry, especially up in his neck of the woods in Townsville. Mr Speaker, during the COVID-19 period, defence industry has not missed a beat, and from the beginning of the crisis we were determined that the show would go on. And indeed, that's what our government has been very focused on, to make sure that we could keep the wheels of defence industry, defence manufacturing, turning. And indeed, that is exactly what we have done, with a particular focus on ensuring that small business in defence industry not is only surviving, but is also thriving. And I have no doubt that the steps that we've taken over the last three months have ensured that we've saved thousands of Australian jobs. Together with the Department of Defence and CASG, we've done everything we can over the last three months to get those projects out the door to ensure that the men and women in service get the capability that they deserve. And one such project, which I announced with the member for Herbert, was a $40 million project at the RAF base in Townsville. The exciting uh, element of this project, Mr Speaker, is that 90 per cent of the work for that project will go to local regional uh, 
companies some 400 local jobs, and it's just such a great example of the capability of regional Australia. Another good example of regional capability is Pentark Industrial, which is based in Wangaratta. We've just recently announced a $15 million contract with them for four years for the supply of defence equipment. Mr. Speaker, another good example of the capability of defence uh, capability of regional Australia and also supporting those regional jobs. Um, it really is a good regional um, Australia story. Mr Speaker, Defence has continued to fast-track payments to defence industry. We've, we've paid some 110,000 invoices since March. $9 billion in invoices have been paid. $7 billion of that has been paid early. So, as you can see, we've done everything we can to ensure that when we get to the end of this crisis that defence industry is not weaker, it is indeed much stronger. This cash flow, of course, has been very welcomed by the big end of town, the major contractors, but more importantly, those funds have flowed down to the small end of town. And as I say, I have no doubt we've saved thousands of those jobs, particularly um, with those small businesses. Uh, since I last uh, rose and spoke here, Mr Speaker, we've continued to speak on a weekly basis with all the um, industry CEOs, industry groups, defence advocates. Um, to ensure that we know what the issues are and one by one we've been able to so solve those problems. The feedback we're receiving from industry is incredibly um, powerful and very positive. They know that, that we've got their back and they understand that. So together, by more communication, more collaboration, we're ensuring that we have indeed a very strong defence industry, very, very strong defence manufacturing base here in Australia. The member for Gilmore. Uh, my question is to the Prime Minister. I refer the Prime Minister to his election promise that the government would develop a real-time dairy payment system to help our farmers get paid faster for their produce. Why has the Prime Minister broken his election promise and left dairy farmers behind? The Minister for Agriculture. Well, uh, thank you, Mr Speaker, and I can thank the honourable member for her question. The dairy industry uh, is going through a transition, uh, and we have lived up to a number of the suite of measures that we have put in place, firstly around the Dairy Code of Conduct, that when it goes into, and started with its first initial prices being displayed by processors on the 1st of June, and we'll continue to ensure and work with the ACCC around refining that. That was one of the key planks of our, of our election promises. Along, along with a market platform uh, and a number of other measures that we've asked the Australian Dairy Federation to support, we are working with them uh, around expediting those because when I became Agriculture Minister again, there was a number of measures that we needed to ensure uh, complemented the Dairy Code of Conduct. Uh, what we have said that we wanted to work with all parts of the dairy industry, as well as the processing sector, as well as supermarkets. We've done that in a constructive way and we'll continue to do that. Uh, I know those opposite wanted to have another ACCC inquiry into the, into the dairy. They don't need to. They didn't need to because it only cost the Australian taxpayer $2 million. But it seems they now want to take the advice, want to take the advice on the dairy industry from Pauline Hanson and One Nation. They want to re-regulate an industry. Uh, that, that is frightening. That is a reckless act that would destroy agriculture, not just the dairy industry. And those great, those great reformers of Paul Keating and Kobe sitting in their chairs today watching at question time, I'll just squaring say, I'll wondering just what say the, to the minister. But don't worry, minister, Mr. Keating, we're going to do it over slowly. We'll... Has the minister concluded? The member for Menzies. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I ask the Attorney General and Minister for Industrial Relations if he will update the House on how. The Morrison government is working with businesses, employer groups and unions to develop reform to critically create jobs which are critical in themselves to driving the Australian economy out of the COVID-19 pandemic. The Attorney General and Minister for Industrial Relations. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I thank the member for his question. And the member has seen many events in his time in this House, but I'm sure that um, the event that we now face is extraordinary. Uh, he knows that, uh, and the task that we will have of regrowing hundreds and thousands of jobs will occupy us and will be the great achievement, if we can manage it, of all of our professional lives and the life of this parliament. There are 600,000 jobs that were lost in a matter of weeks, 1.6 million people now relying on JobSeeker, 
JobKeeper is supporting millions more, including those working less hours. And as enormous as that task presently is, it could have been so much more challenging had it not been for the stabilising effects of the forward employment that is guaranteed by mega projects, particularly in oil and gas uh, and in mining. Where those projects have been successfully constructed or construction has successfully commenced, they have the effect of baking tens of thousands of jobs into the long run economy. And that has this stabilising effect even in crises like the one that we have just seen. And the sheer scale of the job growth that these projects can provide is just completely awesome. Chevron's Australia's Wheatstone natural gas project in WA, that creates 30,000 direct and indirect jobs out to 2040, and it adds $180 billion to GDP. Likewise, Woodsub's Borough Hub natural gas project in WA is estimated to support the creation of approximately 4,000 full-time jobs a year over the life of the project, which is 40 years. So these projects are utterly critical to stabilising the effects we've experienced, utterly critical to further job growth, because they bake these jobs into the economy. And one of the um, huge efforts that we must make in growing out of this crisis is asking and answering this question, how do we attract more of these projects to Australia in the coming years? How do we get them into Australia? How do we get them through banking feasibility stage? And how do we get construction locked in and commenced? And it is a very, very competitive market for these projects. Any uncertainty in governance structures, contracts, policy, construction costs, then Australia can miss out. And all of the major investors and the major players in these projects say one thing consistently to both sides of this parliament, and that is that one simple improvement to the Fair Work Act could create enormous increases in certainty and very significantly increase Australia's prospects of attracting this type of investment, and that is having enterprise agreements for the life of the project, not limited to four years when some of these projects go eight, 10, 12 years in construction. All of these major experienced contributors in this field say that this simple thing can help drive Australia out of the challenge that we now find ourselves in, and that is the fifth working group that we will be working on. The Minister's time has concluded. The member for Rankin. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Will the Prime Minister look at extending the JobKeeper wage subsidy beyond September, as suggested by the Reserve Bank Governor? The Treasurer has the call. Well, thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank the member for Rankin for his question. I too have enjoyed that profile piece on the weekend Australian on his leadership credentials, but maybe not as much as the leader of the opposition, Mr Speaker. Now the reality is, as the honourable member knows, the Reserve Bank Governor said that it is actually too early to tell what the state of the economy will be in a number of months. But what he did say is that the economic support that the government has been providing has been very very substantial, Mr Speaker, and making a real difference in helping to keep people uh, connected to their employer and staying in a job, Mr Speaker. Now, we have announced that we will be doing a review, a review over the course of this month, and the outcomes of that review into the JobKeeper program and the assembly of the data will inform decisions that the government uh, will take about the future of that program and any announcements around the future of that program will be made on the 23rd of July, Mr. Speaker, when the Finance Minister and I provide an economic and fiscal update. But, Mr. Speaker, the JobKeeper program has been saving lives and protecting livelihoods, Mr. Speaker. It is helping millions of uh, employees and hundreds of thousands of businesses right across the country. But, Mr. Speaker, what I do know is that at a time of need, because the economy was in a position of economic strength, because we had balanced the budget, because we had provided uh, Mr. Speaker, substantial tax cuts and got people off welfare into work, we were in a position to support the Australian economy with some $260 billion, or over 13 per cent of GDP, which is massive macroeconomic support, in the words of the OECD, and has seen Australia perform remarkably well on not just the health front but on the economic front as well. Yeah. The member for Longman. Mr Speaker, 
My question is to the Assistant Treasurer and Minister for Housing. Will the Minister please outline to the House how the Morrison government's home builder program will create jobs and provide a boost to the economy as we come out of the other side of the COVID-19 pandemic? The Assistant Treasurer and Minister for Housing. Well, thanks very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank uh, the member for Longman for his question. He's a champion for all of the people in his electorate who are employed in the residential construction industry, and he's a great supporter of the Home Builder Program. The Home Builder Program, I might say, for the member for Longman, uh, has, as I said earlier today, seen huge interest around this country. We have seen uh, sales of house and land packages, as I've said, increase by up to 70 per cent. New homes means more jobs and protecting jobs in the residential construction industry. In fact, the Home Builder uh, website uh, through Treasury has seen 250,000 hits in just the last week, yeah, yeah. and it will please the member for Longman and indeed all of the uh, members of this side of the House to know that the highest amount of interest has come from Queensland. Many Queenslanders are seeking uh, to utilise this as an opportunity. And if you add the $25,000 Home Builder grant, as a first home buyer in Queensland, you can add the state government $15,000 grant on top of that, meaning for first home buyers uh, in the member for Longman's electorate will receive $40,000 in assistance to purchase their new homes. And some of the typical case studies, uh, given the shadow minister wants to re rely on quotes, a number of case studies uh, that highlight this point. We've got Tom Peterson and Kim Backman, who said and goes to the Prime Minister's point earlier too, we've been talking about it for a little while, just trying to scrape together enough cash for a deposit, but that's been made a little easier now. We figured we'll get a new build if we can, and with all the incentives around, that has made it possible. So by providing the Home Builder grant of $25,000, the biggest single grant of its kind by a federal government, we will see first home buyers getting into the market. We will see first-home buyers purchasing the typical house and land package or apartment. We will see people undertaking substantial rebuilds, a knockdown and a rebuild. And the Treasurer has said we expect to see 7,000 of those. That will support hundreds of thousands of jobs in the residential construction industry. And to highlight my point about how much interest the Home Builder Scheme has created uh, for many, many buyers in the market, Julian Capini from the Oliver Hume Group told Domain the following. The initial response to the announcement of Home Builder has been extremely positive. We are seeing a combination of previous buyers who had delayed their purchase as a result of the uncertainty around COVID-19 coming back to the market, combined with buyers who are in the market to take advantage of Home Builder and other incentives. The Western Australian Labor government have also backed in Home Builder with a $20,000 grant. The Tasmanian government has backed in Home Builder with a $20,000 grant to support people in the member the for Longwoods electorate and around the country. The has concluded. I call the member for Canberra. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. I refer to reports today that coalition MPs, including the member for Leichhardt, want JobKeeper extended beyond September. But the Prime Minister is refusing to rule out kicking workers in other industries off JobKeeper before September. Why can't the Prime Minister be clear? Which Australians will he leave behind? The Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. From the very outset of this crisis, the government has put in place the most comprehensive, the largest set of income support and economic lifeline measures that this country has ever seen. And the one we started with was JobSeeker, because JobSeeker, the unemployment benefit, is the safety net that sits right under all Australians if they find themselves out of work. That's what we did first. The second measure, substantive measure, that we put in place for income support was JobKeeper. Now, JobKeeper was put in, uh, in, in to ensure that Australians could find themselves continuing to be on the books of employers and doing some work in some cases, Mr Speaker, and they would be there in that arrangement for six months. That has bought our economy critical time. If businesses were put in a position that they had to make decisions back in, in March and April Mr. Speaker, about whether those employees could stay in those businesses, we would have seen millions more find themselves on their way seeking support 
through the unemployment system. Now, Mr. Speaker, that decision bought those businesses time. It bought the Australian economy time. When other countries were only going for three months, we took the decision to go for six months, and that provided some certainty and confidence. And since that time, we have seen consumer confidence restore under the ANZ index and 70 per cent restore by business since the COVID crisis hit. Now we are going through the same thoughtful, meticulous process of considering the data and looking forward and reviewing the program to make the right set of decisions about the right combination of income supports and fiscal supports to the economy that would be in place after the end of September. This is how our government makes decisions. We do things carefully, considering the advice, looking at the economic environment and ensure we make those decisions at the right time. JobKeeper is there till the end of September, Mr Speaker. That's why we put it in place. It will remain in place till the end of September and, Mr Speaker, it will continue to provide that confidence. At the same time, the Treasurer and I and the members of the Cabinet will work together with the members of the government to ensure that we get the right balance and mix of fiscal policies because it's the fiscal policies given the absence of monetary ammunition that's in the system, Mr Speaker, that will be so important. But we want, above all things, above all things, is to get Australians back into jobs. jobs. Australians don't want to be on JobKeeper or JobSeeker. They want to be in jobs, Mr Speaker. And what we hear from the opposition all the time Negative. is how they would seek to keep people back, not allow them to go forward. Right. And the policies we will put in place and continue to put in place will be about them not only getting the support they need when the they Prime need Minister's it, but in the jobs they concluded. need. concluded, and I call the member for Nichols. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Regional Health, Regional Communi Communications and Local Government. Will the minister update the House on measures the Morrison McCormack government is taking to support local communities with practical health reforms, including the new pharmacy agreements, through the COVID-19 pandemic and beyond? The Minister for Regional Health, Regional Communications and Local Government. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to uh, thank the member for Nichols for his question and recognise that he is a very fierce and strong advocate for health delivery in his electorate. Mr Speaker, uh, the regions of Australia have come through are, uh, and are dealing with the uh, COVID-19 crisis very well, despite uh, a couple of hotspots that were handled very, very well by the federal government and state authorities. Regional Australia has had a very, very low level of infection and, uh, uh, and have, have re re remained remarkably unscathed uh, through this time. This has been achieved by uh, the, the uh, quick rollout of telehealth services, uh, more implementation of the uh, uh, money for retrieval for the flying doctor, uh, for care flight, 133 uh, GP-led respiratory clinics, more than half of those uh, in regional Australia, and uh, some great work by the Rural Health Commissioner, Professor Paul Worley, who, uh, despite the regular work he's been doing on uh, formulating policy for health delivery in regional Australia has played a pivotal role uh, in the corona-19 crisis, uh, helping GP-led respiratory clinics. And the role of the Rural Health Commissioner has been very, very important since it was instigated in 2019. I'm very proud to say, Mr Deputy Speaker, that this morning I introduced into this House uh, the uh, legislation that hopefully will be debated next week uh, to um, extend that role of Rural Health Commissioner, the Office of the Rural Health Commissioner, into the future. It will have an expanded role. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the next Rural Health Commissioner will have two deputies uh, with uh, experience in uh, allied health, nursing and Indigenous health. Uh, and uh, to, to, to understand that we are going to have a more holistic and multidisciplinary approach, approach to delivering health services to regional Australia, and along with pharmacy. Uh, I would like to acknowledge the work that the Health Minister has done this week in securing the seventh community pharmacy agreement so that there is certainty uh, in that sector. Because, quite frankly, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, regional Australia uh, is best serviced when we are using all the resources we have at, our, uh, have at hand. And so, with the Rural Health Commissioner, uh, with the pharmacy agreement, uh, we, we will deliver. Uh, 
a, a, a service to regional Australia that it deserves. And with regards to COVID-19, the, the regions have come out very strongly. People have worked out that they can actually uh, work with customers overseas in capital cities from the regions. And uh, regional Australia not only has kept this country afloat during this time, it is the way of the future. And so if, if we are going to reach the full potential of regional Australia, the people of the regions are going to have a health service that is what they deserve and what they need. The member for Rankin has the call. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Has the government modelled how many Australians will have to join the unemployment queues when the JobKeeper wage subsidy is suddenly withdrawn under the Prime Minister's hard snapback in September? The Treasurer. Well, Mr Speaker, as um, the Secretary of the Treasury said uh, to the COVID committee uh, recently, he expects unemployment in the September quarter to, to reach about 8 per cent. Now, Mr. Speaker, we know that people are doing it tough at the moment. We've gone through a one in a hundred year event. But we also know that we're starting to see confidence pick up across the Australian economy, Mr. <laughs> Speaker. And we have seen consumer confidence pick up around 90 per cent from the its launch. The Treasurer will resume his seat. The member for Rankin, just before he raises his point of order, uh, the Treasurer is only 30 seconds in. Okay. The Treasurer has the call. Mr Speaker, we've seen the consumer confidence pick up around 90 per cent of its lows and, se and biz business confidence pick up from around 70 per cent of its lows. So, Treasury, in relation to the question uh, that was asked uh, by the member for Rankin, will continue to assess the economic situation and we are undertaking a review into JobKeeper, Mr. Speaker, and we will make decisions about the future of that program, and we will announce those decisions on the 23rd of July. But, Mr. Speaker, I tell you what helps create jobs: it's lower taxes, the Mr. Speaker. Treasurer will resume his seat. The manager of opposition business on a point of order. Yeah, Mr. Speaker, we've had the preamble now on direct relevance. The question goes specifically to whether the government has done modelling or whether they haven't on this issue. I just I hear the manager of opposition business, and it, on the face of it, he makes a reasonable point. The difficulty I've got is if that was just the question, without the assertion about hard snapback in September and, and all the rest of it, it does open up for the preamble that's occurred. I think the Treasurer now has to bring himself to the question where he was, at, where he was going just as the manager of opposition business approached the dispatch box was on to uh, the topic of tax, and that is not relevant to the question, either directly or indirectly, I've got to say. The Treasurer. Uh, Treasury and the government continue to assess the situation. Decisions will be taken about the future of the JobKeeper program, and announcements will be made accordingly. The member for McKellar. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Can the Prime Minister outline for the House how the Morrison government is supporting Australian workers and businesses to recover from the economic effects of the COVID-19 pandemic and why it is so important that we do not suffer from a second wave of infections? The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, th these are incredibly extraordinary times. Extraordinary in so many different ways, but in a week when the OECD handed out its forecasts for this current year and Australia was ranked third in those economies that were assessed, but third with a forecast which said exactly. that our GDP would fall by 5 per cent, but that yet we were still the third ranked yeah. economy on this measure. This is a, these are extraordinary times. The idea that your economy would fall by 5 per cent, but that would still place you in the top three of those countries served by, surveyed by the OECD is an indicator of the times and the challenges that we are facing. And the great challenge that we face is dual. It is to stay on top of the health pandemic, as we have always said, but it is to address the economic crisis. We have always believed that both of those had to be addressed in equal measure. That view was not shared by those opposite, but it was certainly where we started and we continue to this day. 
Now, Mr. Speaker, the economic challenge is addressed through the economic supports and lifelines that we have put in place at record levels exactly. in record time mm. and extended it over a period to give Australians confidence. But what we have also done through the Job Maker program is embark on what the decisions are that we have to make on changes in our economy, whether they be in industrial relations, in skills, in deregulation, in infrastructure, in particular in energy, to make sure that Australians industry can get the gas it needs, and I welcome the decisions that have been taken by states to open up the gas. In all of these areas, that's where you grow the economy, because that's where the jobs are going to come from for all of those thousands, indeed millions of Australians, who have got less hours and they have lost their jobs. And we have made great, great progress, but the challenge ahead is even greater. So the decisions we make now are about the next five years. And the five years of changes we make will set up the next 30 years of prosperity. And we cannot put it at risk. And so that's why I say to those who on this weekend, Mr. Speaker, are contemplating engaging in a mass rally, don't do it. Follow the health advice. Don't attend. Do the right thing by your fellow Australians. Mm -hmm. Protect the lives and the livelihoods. Protect the businesses. Now is a time not to talk about what people want to tear down, but what we're going to build up, Mr. Speaker, together. And, Mr. Speaker, I would urge those who are considering this, I say it in total respect for the issues they wish to raise. Please find another way to do it and do it with the support of your fellow Australians. Did you want to? support that. I'm just going to give an indulgence, otherwise I was going to say further questions be placed on notice. I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper.